seated. <clears throat> I like to start my messages off with something a little bit lighthearted. And I heard about this little girl, and boy, she was just really rambunctious. It was hard to control. It was all over the place. And her parents wanted to visit a church for the very first time, but they were nervous about coming to the church and didn't know where the little girl would behave or what she would do. So they made a deal with her that if she behaved during the church service, that they would go to McDonald's right after the church service. Her favorite place, McDonald's, and she, she was on board with that. Well, that Sunday service, as the pastor was up preaching his Sunday sermon, it was one of those fire in brimstone type messages. And he was talking about the two different places that we go after death. And if you are corrupt, if you're evil, if, if you followed Satan after death, you would go to hell. But then he said, but you know what? I wonder, I wonder where the people who are good, and I wonder the people who are just, and I wonder the people who live a good life, I wonder where they go after death. And without missing a beat, that little girl got up on her chair and said, McDonald's! <laughs> Grace and peace to you from God the Father, and from our Lord, and from our Savior, Jesus, who is the Christ. Amen. We continue this, this Sunday morning with our sermon series in the book of Proverbs. We've got a couple more weeks as we dive into Proverbs. We've been looking at the different topics that Proverbs likes to lift up. And Proverbs goes into a lot of different areas of life. Really because it's meant to teach us how to live this life. How to live a life well. We're not going to be perfect as we do it, but if we strive to follow Proverbs' simple teachings, more often than not, our lives will be better. Proverbs was written around the year 900 B.C. by the wise King Solomon, and Solomon originally wrote it for, for young people, really school-aged children, to, to learn from, to read from, and to understand what was expected from them in their community, what God expected from them. And as you read Proverbs, you'll quickly notice it's a book in the Bible unlike any other. Really, Proverbs is sometimes only one verse long that, that makes a point. Sometimes the points are two verses long. These really short snapshot lessons, and they're short because they were intended for kids to memorize and these kids would instill them, and hopefully as they grow, and then they age, and they became adults and grandparents, that this was deeply ingrained in them. Today we're going to talk about what does Proverbs teach us with regards to our leaders. And I know this is a very touchy subject, because I'm guessing that we view our leaders differently depending on who we vote for, right? And I know we've got some people who vote typically Republican, and I know we've got some people here that typically vote Democratic, and I also know it's not polite to talk politics at the, the dinner table, it's not polite to talk politics in church as well. And me as your pastor, I have always strove to, to never let my politics spill out from the pulpit. I hope and I really do pray that you don't know who I vote for. That's my goal. That's my intention. I do vote. I am political. But I strongly believe that that political nature of me should not spill out into the church. But the Bible does have lessons to teach us. And Proverbs in particular have things to teach us. But once again, this is going to be complicated because these two men on the screen... I'm guessing you may like one, you may like the other, but more than that, I'm guessing you probably strongly dislike one of them, right? Because that's just the day and age that we live in. We hate politicians. We strongly dislike politicians. It's just the day and age that we live in. There's so much negativity when it comes to politics these days. In fact, the ads... We're getting closer to fall, and all the ads I'm guessing that we'll be hearing once again will be negative ads attacking the opponent because, frankly, that's what works. 
And we get tired of them, but they know that they're going to continue to put them out there because they're most effective on us. And so as we dive into this, I want us to try and leave the politics to the side. I want us to try and leave it, you know, at the door of the church. And I want us to try and learn from God's word. What does God's word teach us about how we are to either support or rebel against our leaders or we're meant to pray for them? How are we to interact with our leaders today? Now, before we go any deeper, God's original intention for leadership in the world did not involve a president. Shocker. It also did not involve a king. God's original intention for how people would be ruled over when the Israelites first came into the promised land, they didn't have a king. Did you know that? When the Israelites first got to the promised land, they had no king over them. God's original plan, and I think this was a glorious, it was the perfect plan, was for the people to be ruled over by a type of person called a judge. And we hear that today when we think of a judge sitting in a courtroom ruling over cases. But judges back in biblical times, they were different than what we see judges today. A judge back in biblical times, yes, they would hear cases. Yes, they would occasionally hear two different sides and they would try and make a wise decision. But judges were more than that. Judges were essentially local leaders. Sometimes they would help to help militarily. Sometimes they would help fight off against in invading armies. But more than anything else, they were essentially temporary. And they were local. And they would be raised up by their community. They would feel the sense that God was calling them to help lead their town forward. And, and it was very localized. But a day came that the people decided, you know what? We need a king for ourselves. Because they looked at everybody else in the world, and everybody else was ruled by a king. And so the people thought they were missing out on something. You know, if Babylon's got a king, we need a king. If Assyria has a king, we need a king. And so in the book of 1 Samuel, the 8th chapter, it's a very fascinating chapter. God's people come to Solomon, the prophet, and they say to Solomon, you know, tell God we have to have a king of our, of our own. And God warns them, you know, if you have a king, he's going to rule for life. And if you have a king, more likely than not, this king is going to become corrupt. And if he's evil, you're going to be stuck with him. And Solomon comes back to the people and tells them this warning, gives them this, this warning from God. But the people say, no, we want a king. Give us a king. And so the Bible is filled with these kings. God gives the people a king. The very first king in Israel, does anybody know who the very first king is? It's not David who was before David. It was Saul. King Saul is the very first king of Israel. Then there's David, and then there is Solomon, the writer of the book of Proverbs. And the Old Testament is filled with these Old Testament kings. And most of these kings are bad kings. Every once in a while there's a good king, but every, most of them are bad and they become corrupt. But Proverbs tries to teach the people these generalized lessons about kings. And so we read Proverbs. It was for a time and place ruled by kings, but I really do think they have something to teach us today as well. So today I want to dive into three different verses that we just read a few minutes earlier, diving back into the book of Proverbs. So the first one we read a few minutes ago from Proverbs 8, verses 15 through 16. By God, kings reign, and by God, princes govern. Now what this tells me, I think what this should tell all of us, that anybody who holds any type of leadership position, they are there by God's grace. And they're only there for as long as God will allow them to be there. I think of all the different kings that we read about in the Old Testament, more often than not when a king is corrupt when he's wicked his reign is very very short lived here's the truth god is in control sometimes we look at the world around us and we may doubt that we may wonder you know what is god doing why would god continue to allow all this this wickedness to happen but here's the truth and the bible more often than not tells us this and tells us specifically here in proverbs 8 by God, kings reign. By God, we, we, we are controlled by God, that, that God is in control.
control of this world. So that's lesson number one, that the kings in the Old Testament, they reigned as long as God allowed them to reign. And in our lives as well, that our nation and our leaders will reign for as long as God will allow them as well. Lesson number two, from Proverbs 24, verse 21. Fear the Lord and the king, my son, and do not join with rebellious officials. I think this is very prominent today. We often think that, you know, when someone new is elected, if we like them, we'll support them. But for so many of us, if we voted against whatever candidate won, what do we kind of deep down hope happens? Some of us hope they fail, right? Some of us hope they fall on their face. Some of us hope that things, you know, really go south so that the next election, our party and our favorite candidate might win. Here in Proverbs, it kind of warns against that. This, this idea of joining up against, uh, joining with rebellious people and this instinct to just go against leadership. The Bible kind of teaches against that. And, you know, I, I've been saying this, I've been a pastor for 10 years, and I've said this with Republican presidents, I've said this with Democratic presidents. We should all pray for our president. I'll say that again. We should pray for our president. We should hope that our president does well, because when our president does well, when our president makes wise and good decisions, our lives are better. Our nation is stronger. And when our nation and our lives are better, the world is better as well. Now, let me ask you a question. Do you pray for your president? And if you don't, why not? I think Proverbs here is warning against that. And, and, and it doesn't matter what part of you in. And if you live long enough, you're going to realize there's people at the White House that you don't agree with. But especially in those moments, we should be praying for them. So lesson number two, to kind of fight against this rebellious nature that so often we seem to instinctively fall back upon. Lesson number three, from Proverbs 25, verse 5. Remove wicked officials from the king's presence. And his throne will be established with righteousness. Here's the truth. Our leaders have people in their lives that influence them. Our president, our governor, our leaders have people around them that influence them. But so do we. And I think this is a universal lesson. When we remove those people in our lives that are rebellious, that, that speak untruths with the people that, that don't follow God, when we get these people out of our lives, our lives are better they're stronger, they're healthier, they're more filled with, with God and Jesus Christ and his presence. Now, tomorrow we celebrate the 4th of July. We are one nation. We are one people. And I know we've got people of all different political stripes that are gathered here in church this morning. And I want to remind us that we need to strive to remain united. We need to strive to lift our nation up. We need to strive to... Uh, figure out those areas that we do agree on, that we pray that God continues to bless our nation. We pray for our president, we pray, pray for our country, um, and we come together. We are one nation, and that God may continue to do his good will through the United States of America. Amen? Amen. Amen.